Today we visit Westminster Abbey, where the choir is directed by Douglas Guest and the Schnetzler organ played by Simon Preston. Again, the scene is set by John Betjeman. Westminster Abbey is four things in one. It's the history of the Anglo-Saxon peoples, it's great Gothic architecture, it's the most magnificent gallery of memorial sculpture in Britain, and it's a church where the daily worship of God has gone on for 900 years. It was rebuilt in 1065 by Edward the Confessor, the last but one of the Saxon kings. Dying, he watched it building from his royal palace nearby, on whose site are the present Houses of Parliament. And in front of the high altar of St Edward's Benedictine Abbey, William the Conqueror was crowned King of England in 1066. Ever since then, our monarchs have been crowned there. The people have proclaimed them with a shout. The Archbishop of Canterbury has anointed them with holy oil on the head, hands and breast. They've been vested with robes and symbols of office, and the Abbey bells have rung out the news. Ever since then, the business of government has gone on at the Royal Palace of Westminster and has later extended to Whitehall. The Confessor's Abbey, which Elizabeth I turned into a college with a dean, canons and school, has always stood for the alliance of church and state. Edward the Confessor was canonised and his bones were put in the shrine where they still are, behind the high altar. Round them, in a semicircle, lie other kings, Henry III, Edward I, Edward III and Richard II. East of them lies Henry V, and in what's been described as the most beautiful chapel in all Christendom, lie Henry VII and Elizabeth I. As Gothic architecture, there's nothing to equal the Abbey for height and elegant, narrow French proportions in England. The Confessor's building was rebuilt by Henry III in the 1200s, and he beggared himself in the work, which was continued in his style two centuries later. Who says they didn't have a Gothic revival in the Middle Ages? The nave, choir and transepts of the Abbey, with their thin pointed arches and carved sensing angels, belong to Christendom, and to the days before England was consciously a nation, and before France was consciously France. The Abbey's counterparts are the cathedrals of Amiens and Reims. The only English additions are the 15th century Henry VII's chapel with its fan vaulting and royal tombs and stalls, and the two western towers, which were built by Hawksmoor in the 18th century, inspired, it said, by Sir Christopher Wren. People tell you that the Abbey is too chock-a-block with monuments. I don't agree with them. Those monuments are a vital part of the building. The bronze effigies of the medieval kings, the praying hands of Margaret Beaufort, the gaudy painted Renaissance tombs of Cecils and others who did well in the reign of Elizabeth I, and best of all, the dramatic Baroque sculpture of Robiliac in the 18th century. I think of that tomb by him of Mrs. Nightingale, where death, as a robed skeleton in the north transept, aims a javelin at Mrs. Nightingale, which her husband vainly tries to ward off with his hand. I think of the Elizabethan Francis Beaumont's lines, Mortality, behold and fear, what a change of flesh is here. Think how many royal bones sleep within these heaps of stones. Here they lie, had realms and lands, who now want strength to stir their hands. Come in out of the roar of lorries, buses and taxis, churning through Parliament Square into this carved cavern of waiting silence. Here the choir sits in the same part of the Abbey as it sat in 900 years ago. And here you'll join in the worship that has gone on since then. The organ is built in two parts, one at each end of the screen. The case was designed by Pearson in 1899 for an organ by Hill. And it's been decorated recently by the Abbey Surveyor 
Stephen Dyke's bower with a lot of gold and paint and so are the choir stalls decorated. But now listen, Westminster Abbey was given another organ by the Vincent Novello Memorial Fund and the British Italian Society. This little organ was built by Snetzler in 1764 and restored recently by Noel Mander. In today's programme, Simon Preston will play this instrument and not the large organ, because this one is nearer in style to the type that Gibbons, Purcell and Blow would have played. We begin with four pieces composed during the reign of James I. The first two are for unaccompanied choir. O Lord, grant the King a long life by Wilkes. And Bird, six part setting of Hake Dies. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it.
The other two pieces from this period are both by Orlando Gibbons. After being organist of the Chapel Royal for 19 years, he was appointed to Westminster Abbey in 1623, and so was responsible for directing the music at the funeral of James I two years later. Gibbons himself died only two months after that. Simon Preston now plays one of his fantasias on a little Snetzler organ, and then the choir, conducted by Douglas Guest, sings his setting of the words of Psalm 47, O oh, clap your hands together, all ye people.
Two of the most famous composers after the Restoration were both organists at Westminster Abbey, Henry Purcell and John Blow. The choir now sings Purcell's anthem, Hear My Prayer. Then two works by Blow, his organ voluntary in D minor, played by Simon Preston, and his anthem, God is Our Hope and Strength.
Finally, bring us, O Lord, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven. Words by the Dean of St. Paul's, John Dunn, and music by William Harris, written while he was organist at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. anthem by William Harris ends this program from Westminster Abbey which was introduced by John Betjeman.